Hello, and welcome to A Glimpse of Hell, a laid-back podcast discussing the scum of humanity that you love to hate. You can hear all our content on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for juicy comments and gossip. Please give us a nice review. Should you not, your safety cannot be guaranteed. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first episode of 2022 of A Glimpse of Hell with Rachel and Matt here in Melbourne, Australia. Matt, congratulations. Firstly, congratulations on your wedding. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, uh, a lot of new arrivals. We've got a baby coming. We've had a puppy arrive. Got a new house. And that is all why it is completely my fault that we're a bit um, behind on uh, the beginnings of this year's episodes. I hope you will forgive me. Oh, no problem at all. Matt had a beautiful home wedding because of all the the issues with um, COVID and trying to have public events, although that seems to be getting a little bit better now. But we had a uh, a beautiful day at Matt's parents' house, a lovely garden wedding, uh, and also had the chance to recently visit Matt at his new palatial residence in another area of Melbourne, although we are here at the resort studios once again, aka my back flat, and we're talking about another true crime historical case, the case of Lizzie Borden today. Yeah, I reckon this is going to be one of those Topics that will get us a lot of uh, heated stuff going in the comments. Mm. Now, uh, I, I admit sometimes I enjoy the thought of that for rating's sake. Yeah. <laughs> well, Lizzie Borden is something we're aware of. One, because we're kind of interested in American culture. And two, um, you know, I've always heard about Lizzie Borden, obviously being a bit older than Matt, and there's been various movies. There's the famous nursery rhyme. But it's not something that's well known – that well known here in Australia. I mean, maybe they might know of the name, but not actually of the the true crime story surrounding Lizzie Borden. Although our American um, listeners will be very familiar with this because it's such a part of American pop culture. Yeah, I happened across Lizzie Borden's name in high school just because I was one of those people that actually went into the library now and then. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think I opened up a history of crime book or something of that mm-hmm. nature, and. Uh, there was an encyclopedia article on that. I was like the last generation that had a little bit of a paper um, reading as well as internet. So I uh, knew about her name through that and I uh, knew the outlines of the case. But definitely I think uh, Lucy Borden is much more well-known in America. Uh, mm-hmm. It's uh, particularly because somebody thought it worthwhile to make her a former home of a crime scene into an Airbnb. Yes, or maybe I not an Airbnb, that, uh, but uh, definitely uh, a B and B. Yeah, her uh, <laughs> the home where these. Um, so just to just, I'm sure a lot of our audience, if they're listening to this, are familiar with the Lizzie Borden story. But if you're not, a very basic recap is um, her name. Full name was Lizzie, so not Elizabeth, just Lizzie Andrew Borden. Uh, she lived from July nineteenth, eighteen sixty. So we're talking sort of the Civil War, Gilded Age. Um, era here to June the 1st 1927 so she actually her period of life actually went through a couple of different ages like that changed a lot not just in the US but like across the world like the Victorian age the Belle Epoque in France for example but she was tried and acquitted uh, in 1892 of the axe murder murders of her father and stepmother in Fall River, Massachusetts, which is one of the larger sort of towns or cities in Massachusetts. It's not that far from Boston. And it was controversial because while she was acquitted, she seems to be the only person that perhaps could have actually done these murders. So a lot of people just believe that she did it and was acquitted for various reasons. There is the original consideration that police had of an outsider, perhaps not on the immediate list of contacts being involved, because it isn't so much that there was overwhelming evidence to make Lizzie the suspect, like the uh, that uh, it, it wasn't um, that there was a literally a 
knife found with blood found or a, or a hatchet found, found with blood in her room or a place that uh, she only had access to, but more that the, as far as working out timelines, there just wasn't really any other feasible option. Mm-hmm. And, of course, uh, anyone who watches enough legal drama knows that you've got to have beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, it's like there was a lot of circumstantial evidence, but there was her defence team because her family was well off and she did have access to money. She was able to actually have a very high-level defence attorney who was at one point the governor of Massachusetts, I believe. Um, when we say well off, we're not talking like Carnegie a house. or anything. No, no, we're, yeah. not, we're not talking like a house with 50 chambermaids. We're talking like a... Uh, a good size uh, double story house mm. with, uh, I believe, one uh, maid, and I, I think the fact that um, the her step Lizzie's stepmother that her final hours were spent uh, making um, the bed where her bro- where her brother in law was uh, sleeping, the fact that mm. the lady of the house was still involved in um, fixing up the beds herself gives an indication they were they were a comfortable middle class, not. A yeah. super wealthy lot, as some make out. Yeah, and her father was um, her father was quite frugal anyway. So let's just go through a few basics and also just a little bit of background before um, of Lizzie and then how she got into this situation. And also what we like to do here on A Glimpse of Hell, there's plenty of other podcasts that will go through step by step the trial, the murder. We like to talk about basics and then talk about a lot of the pop culture um, implications. So that's where we like to kind of draw a little bit of distinction because obviously when we've been researching this, there is fantastic podcasts, there's documentaries, and they can do that sort of more formal stuff a lot better than we probably can. But what's interesting is... And probably have the time to go to the library a lot lot more. (laughs) But what we... What even with our other podcast, when movies were good, where you talk about you know films from the golden age of Hollywood primarily, we like to talk about the pop culture elements, some of the gossipy stuff backstage, more of a conversational format. So that's where our podcast is a little bit different to some other more formal, very well known true crime podcasts. So let's just go through the timeline of events here. So August the fourth, eighteen ninety two, the murders happen in Fall River, Massachusetts, in the Borden household. So Lizzie was living there. Her elder sister, Emma, was living there. They were considered, I guess, spinsters would be the term to consider them. Their mother had died when the girls was were very young, so their father had remarried a lady called Abby. It's hard to say exactly, really, with any accuracy exactly what their relationship was like, but it was very sort of formal and cool from what I could understand, at least from Lizzie's point of view. Now, she was arrested sort of a week or so after, um, after sort of having an interview and giving inconclusive statements. She was the one who was arrested. Um, and then she was actually her, it was June the 5th. So the murders happened in August. And then in June, she had her trial. The trial was relatively short compared to some of the big super trials that we see now. <laughs> Um, so, so by, by June less 20th, phone evidence to go yeah, through. Yeah, that's right. By June the twentieth, she was acquitted of murder, although everyone sort of was of the opinion that, uh, yeah, she probably did it type thing. Because well, everyone except the jury that acquitted her. Except the jury, because there was a reasonable doubt, and the defence did do enough with the time frame, because the murders happened you know, all within a, all in the same morning, all in the same sort of one upstairs, one downstairs. And there were people around the neighbourhood. The maid, Maggie, who was an immigrant from Ireland, she was working that day. She wasn't feeling very well because of something she'd eaten the day before. But the Mr. Borden and Mrs. Borden insisted that she was cleaning the windows and doing chores. So even though she wasn't feeling very well, she was outside washing the windows. So Lizzie was inside the house on her own. The parents were in there and her sister Emma was away. Um, and then I believe the brother, uh, like another the, the so family member he that you was discussed. The, so he was the brother of uh, Lizzie's biological mother. Oh, right. Yes. So he was... I believe uh, on a business visit of some kind mm-hmm. and uh, uh, was uh, out at that time. Um, so Lizzie was actually, um, I believe, in the in the back shed looking for some sinkers for a fishing trip she was yes, about to go on. that's right. Um, 
And so, I can relate yeah. with that. You're going on a fishing <laughs> trip and uh, suddenly parts you think you have uh, for your equipment uh, are suddenly go missing. Yeah, and it's it's sort of like, I guess, the, the, the old age O.J. Simpson trial. It's like he pretty much got off on the same thing. There was enough reasonable doubt to say that he didn't commit the murders, but there's not really anybody else that could have done it, if that makes sense. Well, that was kind of the last final period in, in OJ's case of major legal trials where there wasn't a sort of a popular understanding of genetic trace evidence like DNA mm -hmm. uh, because I think until that point in time, people still had a fairly kind of uh, Agatha Christie era understanding of forensics where they uh, believed it was mostly uh, in terms of uh, dependent on fingerprints and like finding traces of dirt in uh, on your shoes, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, and also now as well, and this is probably a good thing with modern technology, it is just so much easier to trace somebody's movements because of phones and phone pings and, you know, data on your phone, on your wristwatch, all this sort of stuff. So everyone's got cameras inside their house now, cameras in the driveway, cameras. So I don't think Lizzie would have got away with this now there is the matter though that police now have to ha have to look through all of this information mm. somebody has to look for all that surveillance and the like yes that's true it's just yeah and i suppose a lot of unsolved murders now are unsolved just because they don't have the resources to do that it's not that if they actually truly were trying to find the person they could they just don't have enough manpower to do it or just need to know where to look yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. So the Borden family were quite well known in the area. Um, her father's family were of English and Welsh descent. So that sort of plays into what was happening at the in the town at the time when the murders happened because there was a lot of Irish immigrants coming into the town. So that's sort of uh, – and remember, we were in the, the Gilded Age, so after – in the US, after the brutality of the Civil War, once that was sorted out, quote unquote, so to speak, the US entered an age of innovation. It's when the country really started expanding in population, in cities, railroads, you know, it was like the Vanderbilts, the Carnegies, the steel mills, all that sort of stuff. So all these big industrial cities um, were cropping up uh, and the country was being expanded. People were moving out um, so, you know, I always think of like, wow, this was, you know, not that long after sort of the whole Scarlet O'Hara sort of era, but, um, obviously, and also for things to change for women as well, women now, not that they weren't expected to get married and have kids and be domesticated, but there were a few other options for them. Now there was schooling at this particular time, what they call the seven sisters colleges in the U S like colleges set up for women were available. You could be a teacher, you could do so even though Lizzie and her sister, for whatever reason, whether it was their upbringing with their very austere father or just themselves or, you know, Lizzie kind of just from all descriptions of her seemed a bit on the spectrum to me, but obviously that wouldn't have been diagnosed back then. But they had other options in life. I'm sure they were still sort of judged in their community. Her sister Emma kept a lot to herself, but Lizzie was quite involved with the church. And, yeah, so there were tensions in the town with sort of the Irish community and the fact that they did also have somebody Irish working for them as well. But her um, father sort of was a self-made man. He started off um, like in the mortician's industry doing caskets. I don't know if he was actually a mortician himself, was he? He, or... he wasn't a... A body handler, yeah. to, for want of a better term, he did a lot of. He was essentially a a carpenter of funeral relevant goods, so caskets and the like. And he apparently also rented out chairs for when people did home wakes. Oh right! And okay. if you've uh, seen Gone with the Wind, uh, you do uh, get a, a visual example after Scarlett's second husband has died. You mm -hmm. see her house dressed uh, for a home funeral with the chairs. So someone like Lizzie's father would have hired out the chairs for such an event. Right. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Funerals were great business. Well, well still, are. Were, well, least, still, they... still are really. I actually prefer the way they did it then in the house. That seems a bit more interesting to me. But so the girl's mother died when they were quite young and um, Andrew married um, a lady by the name of Abby Duffy Gray 
And Lizzie called her mother, stepmother, Mrs. Borden, although I think when she was a younger child, she'd called her mother. And um, there was a belief with her and her sister that Abby had maybe married Andrew for his financial stability. And um, this also caused some tensions in the family in the months leading up to the murders because uh, Andrew had been apparently giving some money or property to people in Abby's family and Lizzie and her sister sort of thought, well, hang on, that's our inheritance, what's going on here? So just before the – and then there was also an incident with Andrew getting rid of or killing some pigeons that were kind of Lizzie's pets – um, did you read about that part of the story? She had some pets. She had some pigeons in the barn and she was looking yeah. after them and he just got rid of the whole thing. I don't know if he killed them or... It, it is rather complicated, most of the major storylines in this case, because there's been so much sensational material and books building up one on the other. And this is the case with often semi uh, academic texts where they're not every fact um, is necessarily... Um, Reproven uh, with a publication, it might uh, work. Sometimes they can rehash uh, earlier mistakes, mm-hmm. and so there are debates about. So, Mr. Borden did kill those pigeons. How um, emotional a uh, devastation that was to Livy is unsure. Apparently, in official trial transcripts, when dis- uh, I don't know how the pigeons came up, but apparently she was describing them more like livestock. Right. But it does give an example of how he could be very frugal when he wanted to be because uh, he obviously uh, wasn't hard up for money but to not, just didn't want to pay for pigeon uh, pigeon feed. Yeah, and they also could have afforded indoor plumbing but they didn't have it, although I think Lizzie then said well, when she was being interviewed for the trial, she said, oh, well, we were thinking of moving to another area anyway, so what was the point of putting it in? So there seemed to be you know, always two sides to the story. It's like, um, He you know, did, um, for example, pay for her major trip to Europe mm. and it looked like it would have been her 30th birthday present. And with the um, uh, controversy of uh, spending money for uh, his uh, second wife's relation, um, he did allow Lizzie and her sister to uh, uh, take ownership of uh, the a second uh, property they owned, which they eventually sold back to him because they a, a combination of not wanting to be a landlord and secondly, it was kind of um, socially impossible for a, a woman to live independently on their own anyway. Mm. Yeah. And uh, so he ended up uh, paying them about $5,000, uh, which was way more than what he spent on his uh, wife's relation anyway. Mm. So he could be generous when it suited him. And it's not surprising because we see, like, even now, like a lot of major entrepreneurs are known for being quite frugal yeah. because they uh, they know the value of a penny and they, right. uh, and they make the best value out of it. And uh, the same with, uh, for, for example, um, uh, living in a rather relatively uh, humble area by what they could afford. Uh, we know that he, uh, we know that Lizzie's father walked to work and would come home for lunch and often even have a nap before going back to work. So obviously mm. he was then within ready walking distance and mm. so such a frugal person wouldn't have wanted to lose um, the savings of a, of a horse and cart. Yeah, that's, yeah, well, that's a good, um, and it seemed like in back then the town you could sort of easily sort of commute around by walking as well. So if we go to um, August the 4th, the day of the murders, um, just a brief summation of what the timeline of the day was. So Andrew um, left for his morning walk about 9am, so the father, and then um, Abby, their stepmother, normally the guest room where the family member was uh, John Morse was staying would be Lizzie's and Emma's job to do, but Abby decided to do it today, their stepmom. So she went up there after Andrew had left for his walk. Um, so they're giving the timeline between 9am and 10.30 to make the bed. And according to the forensics at the time, um, just how she was struck, Abby was facing her killer at the time of the attack. So she was killed first. So she was struck with a hatchet and... Um, 
And actually there are photos of just sort of grainy photos um, of Abby and of Andrew, um, which is kind of amazing to see. They weren't crime scene photos like today, though. Mm. They were apparently sort of restaged after. Uh, oh, were they? Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, it's like the, it wasn't a case of, okay, we see there's a crime here. We are going to preserve everything perfectly and then get a camera in. We uh, Because like police came in, in and out, so they had to do their best to sort of recreate the scene. Oh, right. Okay. Well, that's interesting to know. Um, so Abby was struck multiple times on her nose, forehead, and then she was, um, once she'd fallen, she was struck multiple times, um, 17 or more times to the back of her head and that, and obviously killed her. So she was upstairs already passed on, already dead in the guest room lying, um, on the floor. And Andrew, when he returned from his morning constitutional, as they say, at about 10 30 AM, he couldn't get into the house. He knocked. He finally got into the house. Um, and then so it was um, the maid that let him in. Then she went back out to do her chores and she she believes that she heard Lizzie laughing um, how well her recollection was or if it's true we don't know because as Matt was saying there's a lot of folklore and stories concerning Lizzie Borden. Um, and then – Basically, she came in and his body was discovered, et cetera, et cetera. But she was actually with him before he supposedly died at the hands of an unknown assailant. So, um, yeah, and he died sort of after 11 o'clock or so and just basically called the lady Maggie inside. Lizzie was like, oh, father's dead, someone's come in and killed him. And then obviously the mother was supposedly discovered later on. So we were discussing before the podcast that we had talked about the Irish population in the town. Obviously, Lizzie's family was sort of Protestant and a different sort of um, Christian faith. And um, when they were trying to find someone to come over to the house, there were actually a Catholic doctors in the area that Lizzie didn't want to come to the house. So it actually took a while to get somebody over there to see Andrew. It says something about how... Because we're not talking like about what we'd stereotypically think as an old lady sort of quietly um, making a judgmental thing in private where this is a obviously a deep set uh, feeling when somebody uh, is not willing to get their father treated by the wrong faith doctor right next door. Mm, that's That's right. So it just goes to show you sort of what was happening in the culture of the time and this was when the U.S., and obviously even in England um, as well, there was a lot of immigration and it used to just be from the same sort of Western European areas, but now there were people um, coming in from different areas of the world and it was sort of splitting up towns on the basis of this. There was lots happening in society at that stage with all of the industrialisation that was going on. They obviously needed workers and not all of them were going to be coming from England. So, um, and it's just funny. I mean, I see Ireland as part of that area of the UK anyway, but back then the Irish were considered quite different sorts of people. Well, they were Catholics, so may as well have uh, been part of a different planet as far as the uh, New England folk who were concerned. Yeah, so um, once everybody arrived, doctors and detectives, etc., they sort of understood that Abby had been murdered well before Andrew. So Andrew was murdered. And this in, is confirmed by their stomach contents. Yeah. Um, About an hour and a half. Yeah, it's um, actually amazing that they did have a bit of ability back then to sort of tell the difference in death. Like it's, you know, hats off to them of what they were actually able to investigate. So once they kind of narrowed down the time, and obviously Abby was discovered later, even though Lizzie came and said, oh, father's been killed, it wasn't until other people arrived and they went upstairs and then apparently they discovered that Abby had been killed. Well, for the people newly on the scene, but whether I guess Lizzie knew that she was up there, but that remains to be seen. So when they were investigating it, I mean, they went straight to Lizzie. She was the person in the house. She was the closest proximity. and she often just contradicted herself in, in all the different sort of stories. Like she'd give one version of events 
on one particular set of questions and then she'd go back. And often when people are, you know, we just know this as a general statement to be true and people are lying, it's hard to keep your lies straight. So whether that had something to do with it or she was just in shock or... She was also given a, at one point an extremely high dose of morphine. That's right. I did read that actually. That just like, that like, like, more, like more than what somebody dying on in a hospital from pancreatic cancer would get. Yeah, and also her demeanour was quite sort of matter of fact and, oh, you know, they're dead sort of thing, not crying, not upset. Um, And the detectives and the people interviewing her just didn't like that. They're like, well, hang on a minute, you're not even upset. And that is kind of in normal murder cases one red flag where the person just doesn't seem upset beyond above and beyond being in shock. Um, So they actually found two hatchets in the basement they found a hatchet head with a broken handle. Um, these obviously fit the sort of murder weapon that would have been used. So everything... That but was, they did confirm by test that it was mm-hmm. animal's blood on them, not a human. Yeah. So like we were saying, there was always two sides to the story. There always seemed to be a, a decent explanation for what had happened. There always seemed to be, oh, well, she wasn't there at that time or, you know, she you know, she didn't have, she wasn't, you know, there was no blood on her clothes or, you know, there always seemed to be something that could excuse the fact that she was the actual assailant. So, um, like if we go on and, you know, there was a friend that stayed with Lizzie, um, her name was Alice Russell and she spent the night in the house with them after the bodies were removed And, um, you know, there's even suggestions that she helped Lizzie clean up some of the aspects of the murder. Um, And then there was also the issue with her burning her dress as well. Did you read about that part of it? So there was a dress that she had that she was an old dress and she burnt it. And then her explanation was, well, that's what we do with old dresses. We don't keep them around. We just burn them. Didn't you get them to the salvos? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, when was the dress burning meant to have occurred? Um, the next morning. So this was the friend that was staying with her, Alice Russell. So this was on August the 5th. So Morse, the um, uncle, um, had left the house. And then on August the 6th, the police conducted um, another search of the house And this time they were going through the sister's clothing and they were looking at the hatchet heads as well. And when the police stopped by again later that evening, they informed Lizzie that she was a suspect in the murders. And then the day after that, Russell said that the friend that was staying there, Alice, said that she went in and saw Lizzie. So a few days after the murder, she went in and saw Lizzie burning a dress um, in the kitchen and Lizzie said, oh, it was covered in paint. I don't know if the paint was red or not, <laughs> but, but um, she always seemed to, they're always, you know, it's one of those O.J. Simpson sort of scenarios. There could be a reasonable explanation for why, you know, he didn't answer the door when the limo driver turned up about the time the murders were happening because he was asleep. And, you know, they're kind of rational explanations, but it just happens to be very fitting So after all of this, she was the one who was um, arrested for the um, murder. But like Matt was saying, she explained her, you know, very casual demeanour like she was on high levels of morphine and other sorts of things like that. So, But the district attorney was sort of determined to go ahead. So she was – so they had like a committal hearing – um, and then she in November, and then she was actually indicted on the murders in December. So she was placed under under sort of like I guess you know in remand while the while it was being investigated. So basically, all through the trial, they would bring up a piece of evidence. And then her defence could come up with a logical explanation, a very convenient logical explanation. And it was, you know, circumstantial sort of evidence. She was here at this time. No, no, that could be explained that she was doing this at this time. Um, 
Yeah, and the fact that the murders happened in sort of separate succession, her father had been out of the house, he came back in the house, there was question marks of the timeline, the defence sort of poked holes in the prosecution's timeline of exactly what had happened. Um, No, Lizzie could have been out at the house at that time because apparently she told her father she was going to go shopping or something like that. Um, And, you know, the dress, oh, that, you know, I'd brushed against some wet paint, that's why I was getting rid of it. So there always seemed to be... Um, yeah, and there was just a dispute of whether she was physically in the house at the times when the murders were taking place. Um, Maggie was outside cleaning the windows and then when she came back in because she wasn't feeling well, she was upstairs on the third floor, so she wasn't around. Um, yeah, so there was, um, and they did quite sort of, you know, detailed autopsies on Mr and Mrs Borden. So there was a lot going on. Um, There was a lot going on. And, yeah, this trial has been compared to, you know, the O.J. Simpson trial just in terms of just the similarities between there can't seem to be anybody else but him that could have done it or her that could have done it, but there is a reasonable doubt. And if you were in the jury of either trials, I would have had to have voted, I know know the O.J. Simpson case a lot better, and I would have had to, the the defence were able to put enough gap between him being there and why his DNA might have been at the crime scene. Obviously his kids lived there and this and that. Even the whole thing just was utterly ridiculous. Like it had to have been him. There could have just been nobody else. But there was a reasonable doubt that he did it and you have to to let them off on that if there is that. So, Well, there's even less evidence in the case of Lizzie. Like there's effectively there's no... Uh, evidence on Lizzie apart from the one eyewitness testimony referring to the dress burning and we all know that eyewitness eyewitness testimony can be unreliable, can be discrepancies in timing and everything. Mm -hmm. In the case of Lizzie, it's more that she didn't have an alibi or the like to outright take her off the list, not so much to push her towards the likelihood. Yeah, so they have, like, in later years, there has been some sort of speculation that it could have been the maid that had done it because her and Lizzie were involved. Actually, Matt and I were sort of speaking about some of the films that had been made and there was a recent film made in 2018 with Chloe Sevigny and Kristen Stewart um, about... Uh, Lizzie Borden. I haven't seen that one, but I will tell you about before we close tonight, the one I did see a few days ago. And that sort of intimated that they'd had a relationship. And now I'm sort of confirming that, yeah, I'm just looking through some notes here. And they, they, there was a rumour, just rumours that they, they may have had a relationship and that Lizzie herself was gay. But I guess, you know. But part of that, I think, is that we can't find of her, we seem to have a hard time these days uh, believing that anyone can ever be uh, happy or choose to be single or or may not marry for whatever reason, uh, we assume there has to be a hidden purpose behind it. But as far as Lizzie's relationship with her maid, I believe there was uh, something where she, in the heat of the moment, accidentally called her by the wrong name, like from a previous servant or something. So that kind of gives an indication that her maid was her maid. Yeah, exactly. And also, yeah, because the maid had a, like a nickname, Maggie, and then she had another formal name as well. So, yeah, exactly. So I, I, and also she was Irish Catholic, so I don't think, I mean, who's to say, but, you know, if it was a private thing. And then the other person was um, their uncle who had been in the house the night before and obviously had been discussing, you know, financial issues with um, their father, his former brother-in-law. I'm just trying to imagine um, yes. a circumstance where somebody commits one brutal murder and then waits an hour and a half to commit the yeah. second. <laughs> exactly. The whole thing, I mean, I can understand why it is, like, it is so compelling and that's why OJ's remained so compelling. 
even though most people now are probably like, yeah, he, he, he did it sort of thing. But at the time, you know, I was actually travelling through the US as a backpacker at the time when the OJ Simpson trial was on and I just remember just how fractured the community was over it. I remember the day he was acquitted and, you know, I was in Philadelphia and people were just running around the streets and all sorts of things and I'm like, wow, okay. And even when we got the news that he'd been acquitted, we were in a bus um, going from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia and then the bus driver came on the microphone and said, well, I don't know if anyone's interested, but OJ was acquitted and sort of one half of the bus was gasping and the other half was like, yay, sort of thing. So it was definitely, and I think the Lizzie Borden case was they weren't going to convict her because she was from a good family, she was a woman, um, the brutality of the crime, there's no way that a woman would have done this. Uh, One factor was that apparently some rule to do with jury selection meant that the majority of the local township weren't eligible. And so it was uh, farmers from further regions that tended to be the main candidates. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think there was only one sort of person also on the jury of Irish, like Catholic sort of descent. I don't know how he got into it, but he actually managed to get on. But the jury was just never going to convict her. And apparently as soon as they went in to start deliberating, they're like, we, we know that we're just going to let her off anyway. So she was a She teaches Sunday school. She can't be yeah. that bad. <laughs> well, she was in the temperance movement. She was... Um, for she context, was, they're the people that brought about prohibition. Yeah. yeah. So thanks for nothing. <laughs> Well, I live in the temperance movement because I don't drink, so that would have worked for me. But but yeah, that's but was, that's your but you do that by your own. I do that by my choice. I'm not not enforced on it. You know, we don't want to go back to the some like it hot hole, like going out into the back room and everyone's dancing and partying and drinking, and then the police arrive. Well, I'd be happy to make it into a business model, but the bribery would be exhausting. <laughs> um. So. Much like OJ, when he was acquitted, he was ostracised by the Hollywood and the community in Los Angeles where he'd been a part of. And Lizzie was then ostracised by the Fall River Polite Society. And um, she did, I believe she did live in the area until she died, but she was also brought back into the public eye when she was accused of shoplifting in 1897. And... um, yeah, her and her sister had been living together and then they had a fight about another woman and then Emma moved out of the house and she never saw her sister again. So they were estranged. So even though they died nine days apart in what was the year here, just in That's 1927, spooky. they actually had not seen each other in like 20 years. So a very sort of sad ending and, uh, by the way, OJ is going, he's like living in Florida on his own, he's probably going the same way. So a very interesting and then it just got into pop culture. There's the, you know, the famous Ryan Lizzie Borden took an axe. There's that whole rhyme which is sort of like the original version of the Freddy Krueger Nightmare on Elm Street 1, 2, Freddy's coming for you. <laughs> um yeah, and just the whole pop culture, you know, songs, movies. Now, I there are a, a few movies out, um, lots of books. I'm sure there's probably a few plays out as well. Probably. Uh, I'll have to look into that. But uh, the three main movies that I sort of came across was the 1975 telly movie with Elizabeth Montgomery from Bewitched, and I actually did watch that. Um, so that basically pretty much just a good chronicling of – And it was quite an emotional film because, you know, it sort of starts off of the day of the murders and then she's on trial. But she's having all these flashbacks and memories to when she was a child and her mother died and all this sort of stuff happened. So, you know, was the dad abusive to them? Were there other reasons? And in the film it is pretty much presented that she did commit the murders but and everybody knew but she was acquitted and they just had to sort of live with it including her sister sort of asked her at the end of the movie I'm just going to ask you once did you actually do it and she sort of just the camera pans in on her face and she doesn't actually give her an answer aka yeah it was me Uh, and then there was a movie about six or seven years ago starring Christina Ricci called Lizzie Borden took an axe or Lizzie took an axe so that was more of a telly movie sort of thing looks a bit sort of gory and sensationalised. And then there's more of an art house film that was made uh, in 2018 with Kristen Stewart and Chloe Sevigny, which is the one that we discussed, which is sort of going through perhaps that relationship that she had with um, with the maid in the house. 
and then some of the events leading up to the murder and then the murder. So I haven't seen the other two movies, but I've seen the Elizabeth Montgomery one and that's definitely worth a watch. You can watch that on YouTube. Yeah, it's a hard transition in my mind from Bewitched to Axe Murderess. <laughs> she actually did a lot of good telly movies in back when they made really good television movies in on the US TV. She actually did a lot of different roles from Samantha in the 1970s before she passed away. Yeah, it's, well, I, I got a lot to, of her work to catch up on, apparently. Yeah, no, she um, and every she's just such a fan favorite. Everybody loves Elizabeth Montgomery, and she was yeah quite young when she passed away. Really considering. Um, and um, she was also married to a very well-known actor called Robert Foxworth as well. So definitely an interesting case. Okay, so I'm going to put it to you. Do you think she murdered them? What don't, say you? don't know, probably never will. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think she did murder them. Yeah, I think she did murder them, and I think it's it's very much the, the OJ thing. Um, I don't have any inside information, but just judging from what I read, the timeline, and she just seemed to be disturbed. Like she just wasn't all there. So she just apparently wasn't very affectionate to people anyway. I mean, her sister was very like that as well. It could be just a trait in the family, the father. She was um, quite close with uh, those that were loyal, like uh, loyal to her, like uh, the servant she had for Years like apparently her chauffeur. This is decades later. Apparently her chauffeur, his son, uh, she paid for him to go to medical school. All oh, right. Okay. So she did sort of use her money and everything to help people out, and, and she did uh, donate a fortune to some sort of animal welfare fund in her mm. will. Yeah, she did seem very sort of like interested in pets and animals and stuff. And um, yeah, so as Matt was saying at the start of the show, uh, they have turned the Borden house into a bed and breakfast. So if you're, I mean, as I was saying to Matt, I would stay in the Borden house over the Amateurville house, I think. Because the Amateurville house, that was all the, ooh, you know, um, the spirits talking to you and all that, whereas the Borden house is like, well, I think we know who committed the murders and they're long gone sort of thing. Yeah, well, I, I would if I was setting up such a business, I'd be worried that I'd get too much of a Twitter backlash. But yeah, <laughs> I, I, I guess it was kind of that probably in the last ten years or so, sort of just before um the we got the reactionary social media. Yeah, that's true. Well, yeah, and look, they've restored the house, and I think it's worth hanging on to to things like that because they are such a part of history, pop culture, and really the whole story of Lizzie Borden was very much for the time there was such an upheaval really good aspects in some ways but really bad aspects in other ways um in the gilded age where these when these murders took place you know and they still had a lot of like overlapping with the victorian era with the very sort of austere you know presentations of how people should be and the moral sort of it should yeah. be understood that everyone in that household would by modern standards be considered a a social tyrant. I mean, yes. like uh, Lizzie was part of the temperance movement, like mm. you you said, and we can be pretty sure that everyone in that house uh, would probably have a million things to say about the table manners of most modern people. Exactly. And, you know, the frugality of the family as well. And, yeah, I mean, some people have a lot of money, but they're not able to spend it for whatever reason. And if someone's going to come in and try and take something away from them, I mean, what was their uncle doing there the night before? So it's one of those things where, yeah, it was probably her, but there is enough reasonable doubt and enough folklore about it and enough interesting aspects that it's like, well, was it her? So um, it's just a very, a very interesting story, and I'm glad we covered this. Yeah, and like, who's to say uh, what other candidates there could have been that just uh, went by un- unnoticed? Like, if this were an Agatha Christie story, it would probably turn out to be the butler. Uh, well, got fired. <laughs> or not even that; it may turn out to have been. Two people committing the the two separate murders or yeah, something. Yeah, the, um, someone had an axe to grind against the mother, and someone had an axe to grind against the father. And they just happened to choose that day at different times of the day when they just happened to be alone at the house, and nobody was inside the house. And then they uh, one went in, did it, went out. One went in. <laughs> yeah, and so and you have a crazy axe murderer who's done the act. What even though it wouldn't have been with forty wax, it would have been enough to be quite brutal and. 
like anybody who's uh, you know me cleave at a stake knows it's a bit of effort uh, uh, well, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, that, and that's without the stake finding back <laughs> uh, so that was the very interesting well what say you what do you think do you do you think that the case was just sort of overhyped in folklore or there was a legitimate um questions around it or lizzie was just protected by being a woman and the class that she was in and the polite society that didn't want to deal with the fact that some one of their own had murdered you know uh, father and stepmother. So definitely an interesting case. Thanks for joining us and thank you to Matt and glad to have him back. He's all married up and he's going to be a dad soon. And Yes, yes. I, I'm imagining uh, future recording sessions. We uh, may uh, occasionally have a baby uh, making sounds in the background uh, depending yeah. on where um, <laughs> we had to record. Yeah, that's it. So That's the modern um, podcast. You uh, just uh, have uh, dogs and babies crying in the background. Yeah, well, Matt's got... Two dogs, a baby on the way, and a cat. So, um, and I, I, well, my landlord who lives in front of me, he has two dogs. So I think they were barking before, but that's fine. <laughs> Good for the sound effects. Thank you for joining us. Oh, before I ruin everything here, thank you for joining us for the first instalment of 2022 of A Glimpse of Hell. Of course, remember, we are on social media, Matt. Yeah, so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I think that's all of them. Uh, yep. Yeah. So you can uh, hear us on YouTube or um, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. So whatever is more convenient for you. Uh, most of our audience still comes through YouTube, I believe, which has always seemed strange to me because, it, like, why would you not just move on to a to, uh, pure podcast channel and so you're not uh, using your screen time? But mm, uh, yeah. either way, we're happy to have you yeah, listening. Yeah, definitely happy to have you on board. So we do um, this podcast once a month. So we I when think I'm not getting married, <laughs> I think we've decided on the next topic. But we like to kind of come in and surprise you with that. Yes. So the next topic is sorted out, and then of course we will be getting back to doing our bi-monthly recordings of when movies were good, our um, classic movies podcast. So from the bottom of our hearts, thank you very much for joining us tonight as we took a glimpse of hell. <laughs> Thank you.